ovako Najdelikane dunija niko te Niko me ne zako priguni mlako Ni meni nje kea neku tafute Mahitaji angu Kuletea Mizigo yote Na kuachia Na itunikane Wewe ni mungu Na itunikane Wewe uaweza Na itunikane Watinda Naijulikane dunia nikote Naijulikane Naijulikane wewe ni mungu Naijulikane wewe waweza Naijulikane watenda mambo Praise the Lord, church. Amen. I hope you've had a, an amazing week. And um, as we get to this service, I pray that the song has blessed you. Yeah? Let it be known that He is God. Yes? That He, the God that we serve, is truly an amazing God. That He has done great and wonderful things. And He is continuing to do those great and wonderful things in your lives, even at this time. And let us just pray to Heavenly Father. We just want to come before you and thank you that you are God. Thank you for all the things that you have done and all the things that you continue to do in our lives, Lord. Thank you that we have woken up this bright and early morning. And thank you that you are continuing to do great works within our lives, that you're continuing to use us so that many more people can come to know you, can come to understand how great you are, our Heavenly Father. May glory be unto you, our Master. And that is our prayer, believing and trusting in Christ's name. And all God's people say amen and amen. And now as we get into a time of praise and worship, I hope you are excited this day to worship him and worship him only. And we just want to sing, we have come to worship you only. King of kings, lion of Judah. Amen.
worship you only King of Kings Lion of Judah Continue to um, sing to him as we say, Nimwa Budu Nani Mimi, Kamasi Owewe. Yes, who is it that we worship if it is not you, dear Heavenly Father? Who is it that we give praise? Who is it that we sing to if it is not you, Lord? And even as we sing this, let these words resonate deep within you. Who else is it that you give praise? Who else is it that you give honor? Who else is it that you have placed above? He who is king over all kings, he who is Lord of all lords, he who is the Lord who made all the heavens and all the earth. And I pray that even as we sing that you may continue to simply worship him, continue to talk to him, tell him whatever is on your heart. If you want to pray, you can simply just go before him. He's always willing to listen. See you. 
to show others who you are and what you are and they may continue to um, see you in us that Lord many more will be impacted because of who you are within us and who you have made us that is our prayer believing and trusting in Christ's name and all God's people say amen, amen and amen and now we just want to invite the minister of the day that the word may be had um, amen good morning and praise the Lord welcome to uh, our service for those of us that are joining right now, we are happy to have you. And um, we hope that uh, you have continued to be blessed of God, even as you've been continuing on uh, in the week. So we come to uh, the first Sunday of uh, December 2021. And uh, aren't we glad that the Lord has given us an opportunity to see uh, the end of the year, uh, as we come to the end uh, of the year in this month. Uh, we thank God that you have been with us since the year began uh, to this far. So uh, my name is Pastor Dennis, and I'm happy to be sharing God's word with us today. Uh, we're going to reflect uh, shortly on uh, uh, some matter that is of importance in the uh, time or season in which we are 
in December. Of course, we all know that in December, we usually look forward to celebrating the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, we're going to be asking ourselves one question uh, that is going to be our reflection. And this question is, why did Jesus come? Why did Jesus come? And uh, as you think about Christmas, uh, one of the key things that may stand out for you is the partying, the celebrations that go ar uh, around it, and uh, you know many things that happen. The mbuzi when you wanna have ku ku die, na kuku, uh, na many other things, the chapatis, and the you know the many many moments that you get to share with family and friends. Uh, but it's also critical to think about why the Christmas season is and uh, what it has to do with um, uh, this season uh, or with our lives. Now, in Genesis chapter 3, uh, from verse 1 all the way to 24, that's practically the whole of Genesis, um, we get to understand why Jesus came. We get to understand why Jesus came. And uh, the Bible talks about what happened at the beginning. Uh, from verse 1, it says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. For God does know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did it, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did it. And the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed, uh, they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And the Lord God told, uh, called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the woman said, The woman whom thou gavest to me, be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that you have done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me. And I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cast above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and that dust, dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put an enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall be bruised, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Praise the Lord. Now, I want to stop there. Uh, you can take time to read through the remaining part, but I just wanted to touch on that because that is where I wanted to major on. Now, we see here God uh, commanding man and his wife uh, before Genesis 3 to not eat of the tree that was in the midst of the garden, uh, the garden, uh, that tree of good, the knowledge of good and evil. But then after that, man and his wife disobey God. And with that comes a loss of the communion that they had. And uh, we see God punish Adam and Eve as well as the serpent at that moment. Now, for mankind, the punishment included being separated from God, which is very bad. You don't want that happening in your life. And being separated from the protection of God. And having pain in childbirth, that's Eve specifically and having tough labor and toil. Remember, labor and work was there before this punishment. But now what happens, what changes around it is that now it's going to be more strenuous. It's going to bring about a strain in his working as a result of his sin. So work was not a curse, but it was coming uh, to have 
elements that were unpleasant as a result of the fall. Now, for the serpent, therefore, it would be uh, crawling on its belly and constantly interacting with the dust and therefore occasionally getting to swallow a gulp or something like that. And then we find that in these statements of the you know, punishment that God was giving against man and the woman and the serpent, we find that God is so gracious that he does not leave it out that he had some good intentions regardless of their falling. And the good intentions are recorded in Genesis 3.15 where he says, I'll put an enmity between you and the woman and between her seed and uh, your seed and her seed. It shall bruise your, her, her, uh, thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. And so we notice here God making a promise of redemption. God making a promise to redeem man uh, from his fallenness. And God is so intentional that even in a moment of punishing, in a moment of giving discipline, he still gives a promise of welfare. And sometimes when we are being punished by our parents or by people, or we ourselves are punishing people, we forget the element of giving hope. We forget the element of um, helping people know that it is not all lost because discipline does not come to destroy it it comes to teach and to help people get out of the wrong way back to the right way and so god being a good father thought that i need to show these people that it is wrong what they did but also i need to help them know that there is a way of escape and therefore there would be a time that God will bring about this defeat of the serpent and, of course, Satan who was represented by that serpent. Now, we see a path of redemption throughout Scripture. For hundreds of years, God demonstrated to mankind, both in word and in deed, on what was required to gain access to and hence have communion with him. Now, we notice Adam and Eve have lost communion with God and they have been sent out of the Garden of Eden, and there has been put there an angel to guard it from their access. So it means that life is not going to be as usual again. But God does not give up on man. Other than the intention to finally defeat Satan, as prophesied in Genesis 3.15, God starts a journey of helping men or mankind know how he can actually get to be in fellowship with God, how he can come to God, and how he can approach God in a way that will be pleasant to God. And so uh, we find that to access God and to commune with God, sin had to be dealt with first. God required that mankind had to deal with sin first because sin was a thing that was coming in between him and man. It was that barrier, that huge valley in between God and man. And so that sin needed to be dealt with. God had said that on the day that man sinned, he would die. And therefore, sin's penalty was death. And uh, we find in Leviticus 17.11, God talking about the need for blood to be shed for the remission of sin to happen, for forgiveness of sin to happen. That without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. That was a principle set. Therefore, God intended here that if sin was going to be avoided, it had to be Partly because people knew that there was a bad consequence that would come as a result of sin. But also, it would also be avoided because people have first and foremost a fear for God. And when they failed that, then they knew that there were consequences that would come. In Romans 6.23, the Bible says, the wages of sin is death. So we expected death for our sin. Man expected death for his sin and his wife too. And every time when we sin, the thing that is hanging on the edge is our lives. And therefore, God was serious about this, very serious. Now, on the day that man sinned, what happened? Spiritual death occurred. Man became separated from God. So his spiritual communion with God died at that moment because he had chosen to disobey God. But something also else happened. People have probably asked, but he had said death would occur. Why didn't those guys die? They actually died. Physically, instantly, 
spiritually instantly, but physically it was a process. That from that moment, the clock of man's physical existence started winding down. It was no longer going, you know, straight ahead into eternity. It was now going downwards to death. So that from that moment when man sinned, his life suddenly acquired a dying capacity that he didn't have. Because man was not mortal at that time. But now in his sin, he became mortal. He would die. So the dying capacity came and man had to die one day. Now, there were, oh, there were only two ways around man's sin that God provided. One, man would either die for his sin, or two, there would be a fitting substitute to die for man. So, if the substitute was not available, then man had to die for himself. If man die, uh, the substitute was available, then man would be spared. So, this is what God does in Genesis chapter 3 uh, to just symbolize what he intended about man. Verse 20, chapter 3, verse 20. And Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. And to Adam also... And to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand and take us of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him from the garden of Eden till, to till the ground from whence he was taken. But verse 21 is our key verse. And to, God, uh, and to Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. So, where would God have gotten coats of skin? Where do we get skin? If today you wanted skin, there was an implication. There was some hidden uh, understanding that you definitely have. You cannot have uh, a goat's skin or a cow's skin or a rabbit's skin or whichever skin you're talking about without accepting that for that to be gotten, some animal, that particular animal has actually had to die. Because you cannot take away the skin of an animal and it remains alive. So it implies that there was death that happened as a result of man's sinfulness. That for God to cover the nakedness of man and his wife, there needed to be the death. And this reminds us of the principle that the penalty of sin is death. And so we see here man dying, uh, you know, uh, the animals dying, so that man's sin, man's nakedness, that shame that comes as a result of sinfulness would be covered. And so God has provided that there should be a substitute. And with a substitute, man can be saved. But without the substitute, man will be not saved, will not be saved. The second option, that one of providing the substitute, is actually grace by God's grace coming to us. That God has shown us grace. Now, for a substitute to qualify, it was to either be without blemish or without fault. In other words, it was to be pure, holy, sinless, faultless, not deformed even physically. And for an animal, it was required to be one year old. So, we found that this animal needed to be so perfect in the appearance of the skin, in its feet and legs, even in the whole of its appearances, probably even in its teeth. Just the animal was supposed to be whole completely without dosari, without any fault at all. Now, a person needed to confess their sins over that animal as a symbol that it had taken his sins and then it would be killed on his behalf. And those are laws of sacrifice given in the book of Leviticus. So you would come confess your sins over that animal and then that animal would be killed and it would like take your place. Your sins demanded that you die, but now this animal has taken your place and died on your behalf. Thus, with that kind of sacrifice, God's justice would have been served, providing for death as a consequence for sin, and then his mercy would have been shown 
by receiving the animal's death as the substitute for man's expected death. So God chose to accept that animal to die on behalf of the person who was a sinner. And then God, in return, would pardon this man and count him as if he has not sinned because the animal has taken over his sin and died on his behalf. But there was a problem. The sacrifice of the animals would not fully satisfy as a solution to the problem of sin. It would have to be done daily. Every day waking, someone needed to constantly do the sacrifice. Every morning, every evening, the priest, the high priest, would offer an animal to cover the children of Israel for the sins committed. And there was a nearly sacrifice as well. So, this meant that if another more final solution did not come about, then they would constantly have to do the animal sacrifices. And in Hebrews 10, 1 to 4, communicates, uh, we find that communicated, that indeed the blood of animals, let me read that, verse 3, but in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance Again, made of sins every year. Let me actually start from uh, verse 1. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things, can never with these sacrifices or those sacrifices which are offered year by year continually make the corners thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered because that the worshippers once past should have had no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices, these are Remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Therefore, when he comes into the... Okay, let's stop it there. It is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. So animals could not take away sin completely and therefore a more perfect sacrifice was needed. And now enter the New Testament... And John, in the book of John 1.29, announces, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And this is greatly inconsistent or in, in, uh, in tandem with what the Old Testament was talking about. That indeed, there would be a Lamb that would come to take away all the sins of mankind. Jesus was coming as the ultimate and final Lamb to be sacrificed on behalf of man. Only his sacrifice could fully satisfy the wrath of God against mankind and provide the best cure to the problem of sin. So, in Hebrews 10, 11 to 14, that is communicated. It says, And every priest stands daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for, for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are being sanctified. So Jesus Christ came as the ultimate and final sacrifice that took away the sins of mankind. As a fitting substitute, Jesus was absolutely holy and pure without physical, emotional, spiritual, psychological, or any other blemish. And he was perfect, the perfect substitute and sacrifice. And you can find that in Hebrews 7, 26 to 28 and 1 Corinthians 3, 11. Now, not only was he holy at birth, but even throughout his life, till he met his physical death. Tempted in every way as we are, Jesus overcame and remained righteous before God and man. And that is clear in Hebrews 4, 15. And finally, Jesus died for sin. Not his own sin, but our sin. And in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin, according to Ephesians 1, 7. So Jesus had no sin, but he died for us. He actually experienced no sin. He did not do any sin. He was tempted in many, many ways, but he stood and remained pure. So having that background, we conclude with answering the question, why did Jesus come? Number one, Jesus came to take away our sin and the sin of the world, according to John 1.29. The sin of unbelief and the sin of rebellion, the sin of independence from God. Jesus came to take that away and call us back to 
relationship, our relationship of dependence on God. Number two, why Jesus came? He came to offer us righteousness aside from the way of the law that brought condemnation. In uh, Romans 3, from verse 19 to 26, we notice the Lord did not come to make us righteous. It came to help us know sin. It came to help us know what is sin, what is not in line with God's will. But that did not help us not to become sinless. It made us even more guilty because we would find ourselves at loggerheads with God's will. And so the law could not make righteous. Therefore, Jesus came to give us a righteousness that the law could not give. And so in him, we have that righteousness by faith in him. And Jesus thirdly came to give us rest from the pursuit of righteousness by the law, which was impossible for man. And I think that is clear in the foregoing point. The law could not give righteousness. Therefore, Jesus came to give us. And also, the law was trained us. Trying to get righteousness by the law was not an easy job. And I'd just like you to read through the Old Testament and especially the first five books of the law. And you'll find that it was not easy even for the Israelites themselves, having seen God in great ways manifest to obey him. And how much less for us who may not have encountered a lake or a, a sea, not even a lake, a sea parting ways before us. Jesus came that we may have life and Life in abundance. John 10.10, 10, that one we know of had. He came to give us life. And not just life, but life eternal. And finally, Jesus came as our advocate and intercessor in our times of need and failure. And Hebrews 4.14 4, and Hebrews 7.22-25 and 1 John 2.1-2 2, 2, 2, declares that we have an advocate that as much as Jesus calls us to a sinless life, there will be instances that once in a while we find ourselves we have slipped from the path. And when that happens, he has called us back to himself to repent. And he can intercede with the Father and advocate for us that we may be delivered. So my friends, this is why Jesus came. And this is the reason for the season of Christmas. So as you think about Christmas, think about Jesus, think about redemption, think about love, think about salvation, think about eternal life, because that's what he came for. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for the time to hear your word and to reflect upon why Jesus came. I pray as we do go into this season that you will help us, that this will constantly be remembered in our hearts and in our minds. And every day we wake up, we will seek to live in accordance with the purpose for which Jesus came in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Enjoy the rest of your viewing. Praise the Lord. I pray that you have been ministered to. And now we're just going into another session of giving. And uh, the words, okay, not the words, <laughs> the pay bill and all them. But, uh, our details will be on your screen. Um, and you're also encouraged to um, give in other ways. You know, you don't have to give in monetary. Um, you can also give of your service. Uh, and so you're welcome to come and serve with us here at Bembley Baptist. Now we just want to bless you with a song. I stand amazed in your presence. You can join us even as you give. Um, as we continue to simply praise Him. The sun amazed in your presence. There is nothing you cannot do. I stand amazed in your presence. joy, peace, and hope. There's no one like you, Jesus. There's no one like you in all the earth. There's no one like you, Jesus. There's no one like you. is your name you do mighty things you do glorious things you're a 
faithful God, awesome is your name. I stand amazed in your presence. There is nothing you cannot do. I stand amazed in your presence. There is joy, peace, and hope. is your name you do mighty things you do glorious things you're a faithful God awesome is your name you do mighty things you do glorious things you're a faithful God awesome is your name yes he does mighty things he does glorious things. He's a faithful God. Awesome is his name. Thank you for being in this service. Now, now we just want to invite the minister of the day to close this with a benediction. May you be blessed. All right. And so we come to the end of our service today. We are glad that you joined us and we're looking forward to seeing you again next week uh, on this same channel. We are happy that uh, you have gotten a word for the week and we pray God helps you as you go along into that week. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the service that has been, and we thank you for the week, week that is ahead of us. I pray that each one of us will walk in your will and in your purposes, and we will be able to touch the heart of Jesus, even as we get to go about our daily lives in Jesus' name. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you, and give you peace, and give you peace, and give you peace. Amen. God bless you. Enjoy your week. Thank you.